Welcome to chapter 21 on Coulomb's Law. Um, what I'm after on this chapter, or the meat of it, really comes down to one equation. But let's go through and look at things that lead up to that equation. If we take two glass rods, um, we rub them with a silk cloth, and we suspend one by a thread, we can actually show that they repel each other, right? And by repelling, I mean when you when you get them close to each other, um, there's going to be a force on this one going this way and a force on that one going that way, pushing them apart. If we then do this slightly different experiment where we rub um, a plastic rod with that fur, well, the plastic rod and the glass rod actually attract each other or move towards each other as represented by these little arrows right here that you may or may not be able to see. So we have a repulsive force and we have an attractive force with these two rods, these two different types of materials, glass and plastic, having done the same thing with them, rub them with fur. All right. <clears throat> so that happens because when we rub the glass rods with with the fur, we're actually stripping electrons off of it, so the glass becomes positively charged. And we'll cover conservation of charge in a minute. Um, so glass becomes positively charged, and what we have are positive charges and positive charges repel each other. When we rub the rubber, we actually get excess of electrons. I mean, on the plastic rod, we actually get an excess of electrons. And what we have is positive charges and negative charges attract each other. Now, why do we call these positive and these negative and vice versa? Why do we do that? It's really simple. Benjamin Franklin sorted out there were two types of charge. He chose positive and negative. Um, we'll get to later. He chose, had to pick which way current flowed. Did it flow from positive to negative or did it flow from negative to positive? He chose a convention of current flows from positive to negative. Turns out he was wrong. Causes all kinds of issues here and there. Um, it, when you get to semiconductors, the rest of the time the math doesn't matter. All right? The math doesn't matter at all. Just when you get to semiconductors. All right, so we have positive charges. We have negative charges. Positive charges attract, uh, repel, opposite charges attract. Turns out if we had negative and negative, they repel as well. So like charges repel and dissimilar charges attract. Based on this and how they move charge, we classify materials differently. There are conductors. Um, conductors make it easy to move electrons. And most metals are conductors, and they're good conductors, and they're essentially good conductors because their outer electrons on the atoms are shared between all molecules in the, in the material, or all atoms in the material. And because those electrons are shared and they're not bound to any one in any particular way, uh, it's easy to get them to move around. Um, if a material does not let a charged particle move or does not let charges move and we're talking really about electrons here moving they they're called an insulator and these typically be rubber plastic and glass those are decent insulators semiconductors um, semiconductors are in the middle uh, good examples of semiconductors are in the computer you're using to watch this uh, the computer chips are semiconductors um, we can use silicon, we can use germanium, you can actually use uh, diamond as well. It's a bit more expensive than silicon or germanium, but you can use diamond as well to make a semiconductor. Uh, superconductors, we have one in the building in the uh, NMR room. A superconductor conduct, conducts perfectly. All right. And so by conducting perfectly, what we mean is the electrons whiz around in the superconductor with no loss of energy. And when we talk about conductors, we talk about conductors, the electrons bump into things, lose energy, 
get moving again, bump into things, lose energy, get moving again. They basically, this is why conductors heat up when you let current flow through them. Um, the electrons are banging into the atoms in the conductor, heating it up. In superconductors, this doesn't happen. Right? The superconductor that's inside our NMR is, um, well, first it's cooled down to liquid helium temperatures, which is a few Kelvin, and it's sitting inside. That all sits inside of a liquid hydrogen bath to help keep it cool there as well. <coughs> Some materials, once you get them down to liquid helium levels, begin to conduct without loss. Okay, um, what we did in the experiment before is we we used a material to pull charges off. Now what you see here, we have a conductor, um, a copper conductor. The copper conductor starts off neutral uh, and actually remains neutral throughout this experiment, but it starts off neutral. All the charges are evenly distributed. Then when you bring the plastic rod that's negatively charged near the conductor, it uh, puts force, and remember, like charges repel, right? Unlike charges attract. And so the negative charges here, all these electrons, all these little minus signs were over here initially, right? So the negative charges here repel the negative charges there. They, because it's a conductor, they make their way to the other end. What happens is then this end has an excess of electrons, which shows up as negative charge. This end has a deficit of electrons, which shows up as a positive charge. And so basically we have polarized um, our turn this copper rod into a dipole, right? So we've made the charges on this copper rod move around. All of this, or much of this, is encodified in Coulomb's law. Coulomb, Coulomb's law is pretty simple. The force between any two charges is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the magnitude of the um, magnitude of the charges multiplied together divided by r squared. Now, I kind of like sticking the sign in and leaving the sign in and taking the convention that this is the force on particle one away from particle two. And if we stick the signs in and they're both positive, that force continues to be away from particle two. If we stick the sign in and they have different signs, that gives the overall force a negative sign and then it points well, if I could draw, then it points back towards particle two. All right, so if this is the force on one, whoop, due to two, right, the force on particle one due to particle two, and we leave the signs in, and it is, we take it as this is the force away from particle two, a, exerted on particle one away from particle two, and we leave the signs in, we get the correct direction on the force. Because if these are both positive, the force is in, in this direction. If these are both negative, the force is in this direction. And if one is positive and the other is negative, the force gets a minus sign and points back the other way it is an attractive force. That's my way of thinking. It differs a little bit from what the book has here, but this is Coulomb's law. Force is a 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Now, epsilon naught, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Coulomb is the unit of charge. Um, this is the permittivity constant of free space. And I like leaving it in as epsilon naught. Um, a lot of people, when they're just dealing with this, convert. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught to what we call k. k equals 8.99 times 10 to the ninth newton meter squared per coulomb squared. I like leaving it in as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught because later on we're going to encounter something called the permeability of free space. Epsilon naught is a permittivity of free space. Later on we'll encounter the permeability of free space and they both show up in much the same way in different situations. 
All right, moving on with Coulomb's law, All right? I said the force is away from two, force on one is away from two. So the force is a vector along the line connecting the two particles, All right? So like charges, that force is repulsive and points away from the other particle on both ends, All right? If it's positive are negative. Unlike charges, those forces point towards each other. The force is equal and opposite for each um, particle, right? So on this one, it's this way. On this one, it's that way. The force is the exact same magnitude. This is exactly like, um, you know, my, the force I exert on the earth well, we'll do it in pounds since I know pounds. Um, force, I ex the force the exert Earth exerts on me, the, the attractive force the Earth exerts on me is about 205 pounds. The attractive force I exert on the Earth is also 205 pounds. So it's the same with the charged particles. The force they exert on each other is equal and opposite. The earth is pulling me down at 205 pounds. I am pulling the earth up at 205 pounds. If there are multiple particles involved, right? If there are multiple particles, then you just sum up the forces from each one. So F between 1 and 2, F between 1 and 3, 1 and 4, so on, and on, so on, and so on, and so on. That is the net force, the force, the force of all charged particles on this electron, right? So here in this picture, we have an electron and we have two protons. So this is a negative charge and two positive charges. Um, the force on the electron is the force due to this positive charge plus the force due to that positive charge. Likewise, the force on this proton is the force due to that proton plus the force due to that electron, and so on and so forth. So the force due to a set of charges is the sum of all of the forces due to the individual charges. 